Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, get clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. We interview preceptors and physician educators who will prepare you for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Good day, everyone. This is your host, Chase DeMarco, and today I'm going to cover a different topic, a little more sensitive and a little more personal topic. And I know we've done this from time to time in the past. I've discussed failures and other personal tidbits that I hope will help you, the audience, especially if you're coming across some of this yourself or maybe someone you know is. But today in particular, we're going to discuss depression and anxiety because it's very rampant in the medical profession as is. Of course, it's even worse right now with COVID, with isolation, with so much uncertainty in our lives. Medical students and professionals are also less likely to seek help than the average person. So these are things that I find very concerning, and maybe you're not currently going through this. Maybe you've never suffered from anxiety or depression or other mental illnesses. And if so, that's perfectly fine but you might know someone that has, or that currently is. Someone that's been acting a little different lately, posting things that are a little more negative than they normally would. Maybe they're silently reaching out for someone's help. If that's the case, please consider sharing this episode with them. So I want to discuss a little bit about recent episodes that I've personally been going through. And this is not to gain any sort of sympathy or anything like that, but A lot of us in the medical profession do have mental health concerns, even if they're just temporary, if they're in acute phase and it never returns. Some are more chronic. I'm far from the only one that has discussed this in the medical profession, and I'm far from even the only healthcare podcaster that has discussed these topics. But the point is, if we can share our stories and you can learn something from them, you can gain some benefit, then it's worthwhile. So like I said, with COVID, the suicide stats have been really high lately for quite some time, unfortunately, and isolation is more difficult for some people than others. There are many factors that play a part in that. A lot of us don't have the social support that others do, and it makes this time so much more difficult. And the factor that this might not go away anytime soon, even with the potential of several vaccines on the rise it's going to be a while until everyone is safe, until everyone is able to get back to a closer state of normal life. And as medical and healthcare professionals, we are more knowledgeable than the average person is about this disease and about how it spreads and about how to protect ourselves. But it's maybe not the best comparison, but it's kind of like an STD in that it just takes one mess up, one accident, and you can catch it. And that stress is really raising everyone's anxiety levels, and it's causing a lot of COVID fatigue at this point since we've been going through it for so long. So I want to discuss a little bit more about what I've been going through lately and some resources to share and also wrap this into what we usually do, which is how to benefit our studies. Because obviously you're going to suffer in your studies if you're going through a phase, if you're going through an episode, and if you're not sure how to seek help or don't know where to turn or just deciding not to because you're afraid to. So let's cover some of those topics now. So I've basically had, I'd say a baseline of anxiety and depression since high school, but for the most part, it's been pretty manageable or so I thought. It was probably much higher in my younger years and then kind of figured that I just developed coping mechanisms. I managed it well. I did something where that level never really raised above a certain threshold, was never a concern, and never knocked me out of my routine for any extended period of time. Sure, we all have a day or two, maybe even three, where we just don't want to do anything. We need a break. And that's fine, especially if you're a busy medical student or professional. We have a lot of different projects working on for school, for side projects, personal family things that we're dealing with, sometimes you just need a break. But when it does so for an extended period of time, as it did to me recently, that is concerning. So basically, I think I had a triggering event, and what it was specifically doesn't really matter because it's going to be different for everyone. 
depending on their past history and experiences. But once triggered, it can really take you a long time to get back to your baseline, for lack of a better term. And when we don't know where to turn, or if we're ashamed to, if we're afraid of gaining some sort of negative stereotype, as is common with healthcare students, then this can go on for an extended period of time. And that's not something that we want to happen, especially right now when we have so many other aspects adding more stress to our daily lives. You can be triggered by a thought or an image or a sound. And, you know, it's really not that unlike PTSD. And when you're triggered, when you're set off and your hormone levels are raising, the cortisol, adrenaline can go through and your mind kind of gets tossed into a downward spiral. And especially something that happens to me is just this repetitive thought spiral of negative thoughts. And it's hard to get out of that. Like I said, what it is that exactly triggers you doesn't matter. It can be something that's seemingly small to you. You might say, I don't think I should be triggered by this. Other people have it much worse off than I do. This is such a small thing. Why is this bothering me so much? But again, it doesn't matter what it is to other people. It's what it is to you. We might feel like we don't have the right to complain or to seek help, but these micro traumas, for lack of a better term, can be just as impactful to us, especially over time, as one large trauma. So, for instance, maybe you weren't physically abused by your parents, but you had parental neglect for multiple years, and it doesn't seem like you deserve that feeling of negativity about the situation, but you can, you do. Those little micro traumas, all the times that something happen where maybe you were left somewhere forgotten about, someone missed your baseball game. They sound small individually, but we also tend to ignore how many times things happen or how strong that feeling at the time was or how impactful it was due to the people involved, due to how we were at that time. And you don't need to, let's say, be sexually abused by a partner in order to have these same types of repetitive traumas these constant, smaller relationship traumas that might seem insignificant in comparison or individually, but they can add up to a lot of other things. So whatever your traumas are, whatever the aspect is that is causing your anxiety or depression, can be studying, can be family, can be relationships, can be many, many other things, just know that they are important because they affect you. We all have negative experiences from our past. And the people involved, our emotional state at the time, and dozens of other life factors can really imprint on us in a way that is different from how it might have imprinted on someone else. And that doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make these insignificant factors in our life. And we can cover them up by placing mental or emotional barricades that help to protect us from these feelings. But these seem to be temporary measures. So that's kind of what happened to me, I believe. I placed so many barriers over past traumas for so many years that I thought, okay, it's gone. It's done. I've moved past it. I've grown past it. But that didn't seem to actually be the case. So I do want to say that the hardest first step, as it was for me, is seeking some sort of help. Obviously, I didn't do that for a long period of time. I didn't do that for years. I covered it up, thought I could take care of it all on my own. But then when, more recently, some triggering event happened that brought on the onslaught of all of these past micro traumas all at the same time, it became quite overwhelming. And something that I found helpful, and you might be different, so we'll go over some different resources here, but I think online resources were a better suit for me. Things like BetterHelp and Talkspace. They have their online platforms and phone apps. They allow you to text message back and forth. They're affordable and you can have constant feedback several times a day, sometimes every day of the week, which is much different than going to see a therapist once or maybe even twice a week for a set amount of time in their office. That doesn't seem very useful for me for how I need to tackle certain topics and when I need to discuss them. And through these apps, through these 
different platforms, you can also share documents. So your therapist can share some coping mechanisms for you that then go into your document room so you have access to them all the time. You can schedule phone and video conferences too if you wish for more personalized interaction. I think having that variability really, really helps us. And it can also help our friends and family or even our future patients that might be going through some of these things. And sometimes just having that neutral party to talk to can be very helpful. You can try to talk to family or friends at first, but they're going to be biased. And your past experiences with your friends and family are going to change and bias your receptivity of the information they're giving. So that neutral party can be extremely helpful. And also things like just getting into nature and getting away from electronics for a couple of days. I know that's something that helped me was going camping for a few days in a complete remote blackout area. No cell service, no nothing. Increasing your daily exercise can be, well, a little difficult if you're depressed or anxious or just unmotivated to do those types of activities in your day-to-day -day life. But they can help you sleep better and help in other ways too. And if these self-care things and other alternative therapeutic platforms aren't really working for you, well, it might be time to seek some prescription help, which you can get either by going to your primary care provider, or you can even find a psychiatrist or other therapist. There is the Psychology Today's website. They have a therapist finder there that might be of use as well. Or these days, you can probably just Google psychologist near me, psychiatrist near me. Just make sure if you're looking for some sort of medication or that type of assistance, if other more cognitive behavioral therapies and other mechanisms are not helping, that you pick the right provider for your needs. And know that mental health concerns don't mean that you're broken, and seeking help doesn't mean that you're weak. A great portion of the population, especially the student population, and even more so the medical student and healthcare student population, suffer from some sort of anxiety, depression, or other mental health concern. We're just less likely to talk about it due to the negative stigma, due to fear of it impacting our relationships and our residencies and other factors that are an honest concern in some places. But it's becoming much more acceptable these days, it seems. But you can still find certain people that you can confide in, develop a support group, support network for specifically talking about these types of concerns. And like I said, we're going to wrap this all up with a little discussion about how it affects us as learners. And I mean, the list is actually quite endless, so I'm just going to cover a couple of the top ones here. Anxiety, depression can play havoc on your memory, especially your short-term memory. It's going to be very difficult to learn new material on a day-to-day -day basis if you're in a state of anxiety or depression and not seeking adequate help. It can affect your cognition, just the inability to think clearly, that fogginess. How are you going to answer questions properly to a patient or on your exams if you're stuck in this debilitated cognitive state? They affect your sleep patterns, which also play a part in memory and cognition. All of these things are intertwined, interrelated. So if you want to make sure that your study time is being used effectively, if you want to make sure that you're being the best student or the best you that you can be, and that your time's not going to waste, you want to make sure that you're handling your physical and mental health. Poor mood can lead to poor performance on exams. Doing poor on these exams can then relate to higher levels of anxiety, and it's all just a vicious cycle. So if you have found this useful, if you know anyone that might need these resources that we've mentioned so far, maybe someone is, like I said, posting something different or negative on social media. Maybe you haven't heard from them in a while when you usually get a text or a call once a week. Maybe they're in the class and now they're just quieter. They're in the corner, not speaking up as they normally would during lectures. If you happen to be one of the few places that are doing class lectures at this point in time. Keep an eye out for your colleagues and your classmates. And if this was helpful in any way, please do consider sharing this with them. 
We will have some resources in the show notes here for some of the services mentioned, and also the National Helpline, which is a free service anyone can use if they're in an immediate, urgent state of depression, suicidal thoughts, anything like that. You're not going to be able to necessarily get in touch with your therapist, even for the online ones, if it's an urgent concern. That's something that you might want to use the National Helpline for. But I do hope that sharing some of these personal thoughts and experiences have helped a little bit and maybe even made it so some of you might not be as afraid to discuss your personal experiences with others. Anyway, getting back next week, we should have slightly more regular programming. It has been a little difficult during COVID to schedule as many interviews as we previously were. So between that and my extended break recently, we've had a lot of rebroadcasted episodes from earlier on. But we do have some really good interviews coming up in the next few weeks, going into the new year, and I want to hope you all the best. Stay safe, stay sane. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or comments you have, and we'll catch you next week. The One Minute Preceptor Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access med school coach services like USMLE tutoring or residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.